Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Boy, oh boy, sometimes you just have a masterclass dropped on you, and that's exactly what we had today, because I had the pleasure of interviewing Kevin, KD Dorsey, who not only has an amazing wealth of experience and advice and is largely regarded as a prospecting and sales guru, um, although he doesn't love that term, and you'll learn why at the very end of the episode. <clears throat> but, you know, Kevin has had VP of sales experience at a place like Sales Pop and Snack Nation. He was the head of sales enablement at Surface, Service Titan. He's currently the practice leader for revenue over at Winning by Design, which is a fabulous organization. And you're going to see the bona fides. You're going to see the goods on display, if you will, here, because this episode is just chock full of insights. In fact, you're going to want to listen for the eight mile method, a great, 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 great um, part of the, the episode. You're going to take a ton away from it. You're going to learn about what does it mean to have a MMS or a double A, you're going to learn about all kinds of questions that you can ask customers to really develop messaging that sticks and that works in your sales development program. Man, this is a great episode. I, I'm going to shut up now and get right to it. Here's Katie. I'm here with Kevin Dorsey, one of the leading voices in our entire space in, in sales development. Kevin, real pleasure to have you on today. It pumped my man when you reached out and wanted to know if I'd be doing it. Like, why not? Let's dive in. Anything that we can do to spread the good, good word on sales dev, prospecting, pipeline generation, all of it. Well, and and you've been now kind of an advisor to a lot of companies, a lot of their their own sales processes. You know, if I just take kind of like the top of the stack, if you will, um, last year or so, you've been working with Winning by Design, a really you know, blue chip name in the space um, around sales coaching. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of your own philosophies that you bring to the table when you're engaging with clients, especially around their prospecting, especially around their SDR BDR teams that you're, you're brought in to help improve. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot that I dive into with, with clients. I think if I look at where I think a lot of companies struggle when it comes to their prospecting and pipeline generation is the, the messaging is way too product focused and way too company focused versus problem and persona focused. That's where I do a lot of work with um companies is, you know, we go in there and I take a look and it's like, hey, you know, hey, Ed, you know, I was hoping to get 15 minutes of your time next week to talk about how we could, you know, 3x your pipeline production. And it's like, no, like, you can't talk to people like that anymore. It just doesn't work. So I think that's generally where a lot of it starts is the messaging is just nowhere near where it needs to be to elicit a response to get a conversation going. Before we go in, in the right direction, because I couldn't agree with you more around problem and persona, why do you think it's so pervasive that, that frankly, so many people, so many companies get it so wrong often? So I think there's a, there's a few reasons. I mean, first of all, you actually have a lot of leaders in place that were never in sales depth. So there's, there's actually a gap there. There actually aren't a lot of me's who are also former sales dev people that became VPs, SVPs, CROs. So there's a gap at the top of understanding what's going on in the market. And then from there, you go to the managers, also not well trained on actually how to, to do this. But the last part, man, honestly, I've talked about this in on other shows and with companies I talked to is like, people are so addicted to speed. Everything mm. fast, everything in the tech space is how fast, fast can we grow? How fast can we ramp? How fast can we close a deal? And that's what I think actually causes a lot of the bad habits is because it takes some time to nail the messaging. It takes some time to, to really nail this. Whereas like, it's very easy to say, Hey, we have this cool product. Want to talk? Right. So I like, that's the last point is people are just, they're moving too fast. Fast. It's too short-sighted with what they are doing, and then it never really pays off in the long run. 
Yeah. And one could even make an argument that's kind of almost in the macro around, isn't that all of society, right? Like we're governed by, you know, little red buttons and lights and updates and alerts and everything is, you know, just distractionville and Mm -hmm. talk about speed. Like, isn't that kind of like also one of the things that just fits very well with your assertion? For sure. But what's interesting too, like, you, you know, you give like the notification kind of example, right? Like we're always getting pinged. If people understood how much science and effort and data has gone into these tech companies to get us addicted to their products, <laughs> if we applied the same mindset and methodology to nailing our sales processes, things would be a lot better. Right. Like they literally have scientists studying. How can I get you to come back? Here's a perfect example for anyone listening. In case you did not know, most of these social network programs do not notify you of all notifications at once. They intentionally delay some of the notifications to give you a reason to keep coming back. So 10 people may have liked your post in the last minute. They're going to show you five. So that 10 minutes later, they can ping you with another red dot. You're like, ooh, new notifications. Like it's that level of understanding of the human psyche that they have. But then in sales, we never talk about the human psyche. We never talk about decision-making. We never talk about how emotions pull into it. We never talk about what fear does to people, what novelty does to people. It's, we, just, we just, truthfully, man, I don't, and I've ranted about this before. We just don't take sales seriously enough. That is my personal opinion. Like if we don't, we don't really take it as serious as we should as a profession. And I think that's also what leads to a lot of the problems that we see. Well, let's change that right here and right now on this podcast. Cause I, <laughs> I Dude, say we hop on that horse and get riding. I'm trying, man. Right. Like, <laughs> no, what other high paying profession acts and behaves the way the sales industry does. Right. Think about that. Okay. If I wanted to be a doctor, I got to go to school for eight to 12 years. I don't need to go to school for eight to 12 years to get into sales. If right. I wanted to be a lawyer, I got to go to school for six to seven years. If I wanted to even be a marketer, I have to major in marketing. If I wanted to be a nurse, I have to practice nursing. All of these things, like they dedicate it. Talk about professional athletes. They practice nine times more than they play. Salespeople don't practice. Salespeople don't get certified. Salespeople don't have to do continuing education. Salespeople don't have to do any of that, right? Like no other profession like <laughs> talks about itself the way sales does, but then behaves the way that sales does. Like it's, it's just, my, it's crazy to me. It's just crazy. Well, I would agree with you. And, and sales isn't even a major at like the vast majority of universities, colleges across the country here in America. No, it's, it's not. And it, it, and even if it was, even if it was one, I don't know how many people would actually enroll in it, but then two, the, the difference being for all those other like professions I mentioned, right? Like if you're a doctor, even once you graduate, you still have to go, what's it called? Your, your residency, right? Like yeah. you're still learning and practicing nursing. You're still learning and practicing sales. It's like, Oh, come on in, man. <laughs> come on in girl. Let's, let's, let's sell some stuff. You know, like, so whether it's a degree, personally, I don't, this is going to sound bad. And there's some people I know in the industry, they'll know what I mean here. I actually don't want sales to be a degree program because I want it to be a program where you actually, you are being taught and then doing taught and then doing spending four years in a classroom yeah. trying to learn this. That's too much time in the classroom there would need to be a balance of actually the practice and execution needed to get people up to speed. Yeah. I guess maybe the, the correct perspective might be more around vocational studies than yes. an actual academic. Like um, a trade school, like trade schools, right? Where exactly. it's eight months or 24 months, but it's like, you know, half in the shop, half in the classroom that I would love that to be the environment. Cause all the sales boot camps that are out there now are like 10 to 12 weeks, mostly online. But again, it's a lot of teaching, very little practice, even less doing of the role. And then they're just thrown out into the wolves from there. Do you think that that's just because like in so many sales interactions, they are real time synchronous one-on-one -on -one, and thus, you know, subject to a high amount of variability. So not enough variability. No, like 
just like in all all walks, right? You got the 80-20 rule. Yeah. You know, you know 80% of the objections out there. <laughs> Maybe 80%. closer to 90. Okay, right? See what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know 80% of the reasons why people buy, you know 80% of the way a call will go. In fact, probably 80% of calls go the same 20% of ways. Yeah. Like, we actually do, you can map most of this out if yeah. you know your persona and industry well we don't even give people the foundational 80 percent. no you can't do it all that's not what i'm saying and that almost always tends to be people's pushback on you know well you can't script everything i know at least script what you can right well, you can't practice everything i know at least practice what you can you can you're like we don't even do those things. Like you said, I said, you know, 80%. You're like, dude, I probably know 90%. I could put you in any industry and go, okay, especially for pipeline. Let's do yeah. this real quick. We're going to go back and forth. Let's, let's do fun. it. Everyone listening. We are going to give you the 90% of objections that happen in pipeline. We'll go back and forth. I'll start with not interested. <laughs> the most basic and obvious one. Already got that. Wrong person. Yeah, that's a nice one. Keep people off of uh <clears throat> You're catching me at a bad time. Why don't you send me some information? I'll get back to you in three weeks. Dude, no fair. You took away one of mine, right? Send me an email. <laughs> Too busy. Yeah. Like, okay. If, if every SDR or could handle those five objections. Yeah. Into their pipeline. Explosive growth. Done from those five. The last big one that a lot of people get wrong because it doesn't sound like an objection is the what do you do? What is this yeah. call up? Where Which is a blessing. Right. They're asking a question, but where people go wrong is the reason why someone asks that question is to find a reason to say no. And right. so if you talk about your product in that response, it gives them something to say no to. What do you do? Oh, we're the best sales coaching and training program on the planet. Cool. Deuces, yeah. right? You have to flip the response there. But those six responses, you handle those. I like honestly, I would never train on another objection until you have all of those down. The 20% doesn't matter if right. someone's like, oh, but what's your API connection? <laughs> Will that integrate with this? We'll deal with that. <laughs> when we get there. You need to be able to handle the not interested, not me, not now, already used, send me some information, too busy, what do you do, what is this call about? You handle those, you're already in a better spot. Well, and I might also add that if you're kind of like building scripts, um, the first one to the objection, it's going to be a much better conversation if you get there first, as opposed to somebody, you know, you reacting yeah. to any one of those six. No, I love it. We, we teach um, eight miling is what I've worked on with my teams for the longest time, right? We called it eight mile because of the movie eight mile with Eminem, right? The battle rapper, last battle scene. He says all the bad things first. Right. And what's really funny about that is there's actually a ton of psychology that goes into that, right? Really? Oh, what's it called? The book is called reinvent you or reinvent yourself. And there's an entire chapter dedicated to this last round in that movie and it breaks down all of the science that goes into that round. I actually might try to pull this up while we're going here. I because love it. It's incredible what, what it goes through and why this stuff works. I will say it, this while you're pulling that up, that scene makes that whole movie for me. Mm -hmm. Like that scene is, it's like it's building to that kind of conclusion and Eminem like absolutely kills it and goes, for those that haven't seen the movie or that scene, they're not prepared for exactly what he does to Papa Doc, which is. <laughs> okay. Listen, listen, this, I mean, this right here, this is one of the greatest chapters in literacy ever. I promise you. All right. So here it goes. For, like, so what it's leaning into is the psychology and the, you know, cognitive biases that we have as human beings. And it breaks this down. So first one in group bias, everybody from the three, one, three, put your mother effing hands up and follow me in-group bias. We are all in this together. Put your hands up and follow me. Herd behavior. Okay. Yeah. Herd behavior. Okay. Out of group bias. Now notice this man stands tough, but notice he did not have his hands up. Out of group bias, right? Distinction bias or out of group bias. Okay. 
ambiguity bias never says Papa Doc. He says this man, <laughs> not Papa Doc, ambiguity, this man we're pushing away, right? Credential bias, okay? Tears apart what we know, right? So the credential bias, when he says one, two, three into the four, who is he aligning himself with? Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre. He is elevating off the credentials of somebody else in group out. Like y'all following me right now? We're not even halfway through the round, okay? Right. But then he gets into the objections up first. And it's one of the best things that you can do because when you say the objection, right? I am white. I am a bum. I do stay in a trailer with my mom, right? When you say the bad things first, they are less serious, Yep. right? Because you said it, it diminishes the impact of it. It actually builds credibility because you are saying what I am thinking, right? You are saying what I am thinking. And then it takes away the ability of the other person to say it, right? So if I say, and we'll bring this all to sales in case I've lost anybody. So if I say, I know we're more expensive than the other guys. Guess what you can't say anymore? You're really like, expensive. Yeah, I know. I said that already, right? <laughs> you take it away, right? You take it away from them, right? That's the key. So if there's it, on your cold calls, y'all, if there's any objection you are getting regularly, you eight mile it. So if you are always getting the, look, I'm too busy, flip it, make that the reason you're calling. Hey, I, I know you're probably super busy. That's actually why I'm calling you make the objection the reason, and now you're leaning into it, right? So eight miling is what, what we teach. There's two other biases that he goes into, right? Like credential bias, he comes into extreme out group, right? Where you go, he went to Cranbrook, right? It's a private school, okay? And then like the humor bias, have some fun with it. Right. I'll, like it's one of the best chapters I feel like has ever been written around this because like they break it down line by line. But that's the art of eight miling for pipeline. It works in your emails. It works in yeah. your post. What are the objections you get? Say them first and it keeps you in control. So there we go, everybody. Boy, that is like we want to just like cut, print, stamp because that is Golden Nugget City right there. There we go. <laughs> um, can you provide to me so I can put it in the show notes afterwards that exact link for those to read yep. through? The book is called Reinvent Yourself. Reinvent Yourself. And the name of the chapter is How to Get an MBA from Eminem. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. And you know what else is kind of so great about that too is, you know, it, it comes off kind of like flawlessly, even though you're playing with all of these kind of advanced psychological concepts, it comes off just very human relatable, mm -hmm. right? Like you got a packed room full of, you know, kind of rap fans who can not only dig the rhyme and, and the beat, but like dig the story. It's the right. story. And if people, if you, we can keep going on this, on the analogy. And again, y'all that haven't seen the movie, you can go, you go YouTube it, right? Last battle rap scene in eight mile, but also it's very similar to sales because no one in that crowd wants to like Eminem. Right. No prospect wants to talk to a salesperson. Right. They are inherently against us. And salespeople listening, even you know, you don't love getting cold calls. So just take that as something to think about. They don't even want to like him. And he can still win them over. It's the same idea. A prospect gets on the phone. They are looking for a reason to not like you, not a reason to like you. And if you lean into that type of psychology, it changes. Whereas if Eminem had approached that crowd in a way of like, let me tell you how good I am, it wouldn't have worked. And when y'all go listen to that round, you will notice he never says a good thing about himself. Right. He tears himself down, then he tears his opponent down. At no point was he like, I'm the best rapper alive. I'm so good. This is, you know, if we're going to age ourselves here a little bit. This is why people can't stand LeBron James versus Michael Jordan. Right. The sports analogy. Michael Jordan has never once said, Ever. I am the best. I am the greatest. Never once. LeBron has said it a bunch of times and people can't stand that. Right. Because also biases, y'all filtering biases. We look for reasons to 
disagree more than we look for reasons to agree. So when someone says, I am the best, our brains try to find reasons why they are not, right? We filter. We are always trying to look to disagree. So if you're reaching out to prospects and saying, we are the best, you are triggering the filter bias to find the reasons why you're not. Whereas in a lot of my prospecting messaging, it's like, we might be able to help. This could be a good solution for you. There might be a fit. Might be a fit. We just call it MMS. Might make sense. This might make sense, right? Because again, if you tell someone, they're going to look for reasons not to. Whereas if you give them the option, and this goes against what a lot of people teach in sales, be very declarative, be very assumptive. You're going to love this. I'm going to look for reasons why I won't. Right. Versus you might like this. I'm going to look for reasons why I would total shift just by a change in language. Well, the other thing that I think is, is in play there too, is that shift in language also like meets the brain where it's already at, you know, mm -hmm. like if you think about a cold call and you deconstruct it, just the fact that somebody picked up the number one or, or two questions on their mind is who is this and what do you want? Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're they're They know it's not their mom calling. You know what I mean? They'd know that within the first second of the call, they know it's not a good friend. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden the guards already up, you, yep. you got to meet people where they're at to, you know, like pull it down. 100%. By the way, I've never seen anyone lower their guard. And I'm speaking from personal experience of a couple of decades on the buy side with a lot of budget and a yep. high title, like, you know, chief marketing officer where everyone in their mother seems to have your number, your email, and wants to just come at you all the time. Yeah. You got to pull people in, right? I, I can't remember where I heard this. It might've been Sharon Pearson. Um, she created a course called Ultimate Influence, one of my favorite courses on influence. Um, I think she's the one that said it. It also might've been Jordan Belfort. I can't remember, but mm. the line was um, the person asking the questions controls the conversation. Yes. And a lot of salespeople think the other way, like who's talking controls the conversation. It's the person asking the question that controls it. And what you were just talking about there is you got to take those first two to three questions away. Right. Who are you? Where are you calling from? And why are you calling? If you don't get rid of those in your first opening line on a cold call, you're giving control away right away because they're going to ask you one of those. They're going to say, I'm sorry, who is this? Right. You've already lost control, but then second, it's always important that you follow up with a question. So a lot of, um, you know, prospectors, right? Because I try more and more to not even call out sales dev. This is prospecting, right? Yes. It shouldn't just be sales dev prospecting. Like AE should be prospecting, CS should be prospecting. This is about generating pipeline. When we handle objections, we handle it and then we end on dead space. We say, what is this call about? Oh, I'm calling from, from science. You know, we do X, Y, Z. And it ends on dead space. And so what we're doing is we're actually giving control back to the prospect where, right, we're just handing it over. We're basically like, here, take this call wherever you want it to go. Whereas you have to, we, um, what I would teach internally called the double A method, answer and ask. Answer and ask ask. So if it is like the, what do you do, right? Sorry. What, what do you do? Well, I mean, you know how a lot of VPs, you know, struggle to get their reps onboarded, you know, on time, like we might be able to solve that for you. I mean, how are you onboarding your reps right now? Answer, ask, you take yeah. control back of the conversation and it starts the dance. So it's things like that where people need to understand it's the questions that you ask that really drive the conversation, not the things that you tell them. Boy, oh boy. I mean, this, this is like a, a page out of the, the teach, train, coach, and endless repetition. Oh yeah, you know, science, we help customers in, in your industry with, with outbound. By the way, are you doing any outbound right now yourself? There we go. We're taking it Boom. back. We're taking it back of like, we're asking that question. And then back to, again, what we were talking about at the beginning, I would add a few words in there of like a lot of companies struggle. Right. With Prompt outbound, people. Right. Dude, a lot of VPs are struggling with outbound right now. They're noticing connect rates are down and attainment is down. Are you noticing that too? Too. 
and what we're doing there in group birds of a feather. We're saying, Hey, other VPs are, cause this is where people always go wrong with spin and Sandler and everything else around trying to go for the pain. If you're just digging at my pain without letting me know other people have this pain too, that's called an attack. You're coming at me. Yeah. Where if other people struggle with this too, it makes it okay to admit that I'm having this problem, right? You're a stranger. I don't want to tell you if I'm struggling with something versus if you're like, yo, I literally like my job is to talk to VPs of sales and they are all telling me they're struggling with X, Y, and Z. So what I teach you called the bucket question. And it's the first quite like the first core question you ask on a cold call is the bucket question. I talk with persona. They all seem to be struggling with dealing with stuck with frustrated with whatever three core problems that your product solves. And then are you seeing that too? Does that sound like your world? Is that something, you know, kind of in your Does realm? This resonate, right? Does this resonate and then the blow up. So the blow up is where we're leaning into alternative of choice, right? Or are all your reps just ramping and hitting quota 100% of the time now? And you give them the perfect alternative that you know, you know, they can't. This is why you don't just want to end on resonate because it still allows me to say no. Whereas if I say, or is it perfect over there? Mm. You know, it's not perfect. So now you are you know, forcing is a strong word, but you're, I gotta say that I'm struggling because I know I don't have it perfect. So now I've got the two options there. And even if they do say, no, actually, yeah, dude, all, all my reps are ramping up. They're hitting their quota, you know, in two months. That's amazing. How? I, exactly. Right. I'm and then least... you be human for a minute. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you teach me? Exactly. You I'm really... not hearing that at all. Yeah, I was like, what? How? First of all, you're already a customer. Did I do something wrong? And did I do something wrong in my CRM? <laughs> I love the humor right there. Did you, did I do so? You already work with us? Did I miss that? How are you solving it? And now you get to lean into the ego because most of the time, like someone says that salespeople try to convince them otherwise. Right. Versus pull them in. How did you solve that? Because there might be a problem in there. How? They accomplished the what? There might be a problem in the how. They might say, well, actually, I got a full team that handles that. Oh. Mm. Oh, what, wait. How how many people right. are in this? I got like, you know, four admins. Four admins. Wow. I mean, that's got to be what? At least 12, 15 grand a month? I mean, would it be the worst idea to talk about how we could maybe accomplish the same for half as much? I love the hold and the pause right there, which allows the brain to go, no, oh, it wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Let's explore that. Right. Well, and what that almost always leads to is, I'm sorry, what do you do? Yeah. The and redouble now, back. Right. Now we get to keep coming back. It's like, well, you know how a lot of companies struggle with X. You don't struggle with it, but you've got $15,000 a month dedicated to it. Yeah. We help solve that for companies, giving you the same result with less cost. Could we get 30 minutes next week? And I'll talk about that in a second. Next week to kind of show you how, see if it might be worth a larger conversation. Really hard to say no to that, y'all. Like it's right. really, really hard to do because it's about what they're dealing with, not about what we do. Big right. difference. Well, and it's like, I've, I've always said, people take meetings, they explore solutions for their own reasons, less so yours, you know, mm -hmm. like always, <laughs> I still have yet to meet the professional meeting taker that just shows up with an empty calendar all the time for any reason. It's called procurement, but we'll talk about that on another day. <laughs> right. Another day. So I want to call on something that I did there that I want people to catch as we talk about prospecting best practices I would strongly, strongly recommend to stop asking for meetings in the next two days. Yeah. Now, again, a lot of people teach this differently, but if you, what happens and SDRs, AEs, prospecting, you know exactly where this is going to go as I break this down. What are the odds they have time tomorrow? Like, what are the odds? So here's what's happening internally. I ask you, I say, hey, you got time 
you know, today or tomorrow to meet? The answer is no. And now what you're doing is you're forcing me as the prospect to offer something else back. That's not going to happen. That makes me go, well, no, Thursday doesn't work. How does next two, you're putting all that weight on yeah. me. And so SDRs, you know what happens next. You say, so you'll have someone, they're right on the edge. And I've listened to hundreds of calls where this happens, where they're right there. They're right there. And the SDR goes, so like, how's tomorrow look? And it sounds just like this. The process goes, um, actually, yeah, you know what? Tomorrow's rough. Why don't you? Yeah. Send Fumble me, on the goal line. Right. Why no. don't you send me an email? Right. You broke the trance because yeah. you asked for a time when it's not available versus how does next week look? When is your next opening? Yeah. It's easier to get the yes and work backwards. Mm-hmm. But asking for a meeting a week out, I can't remember, we saw an almost over 2x increase in conversion rate yeah. by asking for it a week out. And there was a, a study that came out that showed something very similar of like asking for it out increases the likelihood of the yes. Now, you still got to be mindful of show rate, and we can talk about that if we want to, but you got to get the yes. You'll have someone right there. And then you say, can we meet tomorrow? Yeah. You probably couldn't even meet with your boss tomorrow if you wanted to, and they're paid to meet with you. I would strongly recommend with a prospect, ask for four to five days out, right? And again, eight mile, I'm sure you're stacked already tomorrow. How does next Friday work? Yeah. Because if they're not stacked, I'm going to keep drop. I'm going to drop everything I can on this episode. If they're not stacked, they're going to take advantage of the two C's. These are the two most powerful ways to lean into influence, the two C's of influence, correct or confirm, right? So we cannot help but correct somebody if they're wrong. Like we just can't help it. It's like innate, right? Mm-hmm. Someone's like two plus two is five. You're like, no, no, it's, no, 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 no. you can't even help it. Like you have to correct or confirm, Right. Yes, that is correct. We like to show that we understand so you can lean into it. I'm sure tomorrow's stacked is a beautiful one because Mm. if it's not, they will tell you, actually, tomorrow's not that bad. Got you. Or if it's true, back to eight miling. We're actually building rapport because you're saying what I'm thinking. You're leaning into the truth without me having to say it. I'm sure tomorrow's stacked. What am I saying internally? You're right. Yeah, you nailed it. Confirmation, right? We're building trust. So you lean in. This is also the easiest way to get emails. Easiest way to get emails by far is the suggestion. You suggest what the email is and let someone correct you. Yeah, right. So I say, hey, I was trying to get in touch with Eric, but his email bounced. It's eric.c at science.com, right? <laughs> Y'all, it's comical how well this works. So people are like, right. oh, just Eric at. Oh, yeah. Jesus, my bad. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. By the way, let me confirm what you just said, because and with our own data, our own stats, any guesses as to what the highest hold rate day for science appointments for the last three years running is all days of the week? The highest day of the week? Yeah. Ooh, I'm going to say Fridays. Monday. And the reason, if you think about it, is all of those meetings were set a week before because we don't do same day meetings. Right. And so what, what's happening here, by the way, science outbound. So our own stats, our own data, we mm-hmm. know it authoritatively and, you know, it's a, it's a few percentage points higher. So not like dramatic, but it proves everything that you're saying about, Hey, move to practically speaking, when executives calendars are going to be less filled the week that you're currently in, they've already planned out. They've already taken the meetings. They've already built that calendar or their assistants have, mm-hmm. <laughs> it is stacked. So it's funny, and this is what this is also what I love about sales is there's multiple ways to do this. Our highest was Friday. Oh, interesting. Our lowest was Monday. And I had a different theory behind that. My theory on why that was is one, like, first of all, people already checked out on Friday. So they yeah. don't mind taking like that extra meeting. 
Whereas Monday, I felt like a lot of people come into their week unprepared. Mm. And so I see this vendor meeting on Monday and they're like, eh, I can push this. Right. Versus on Friday, it's already kind of on the end. So it's just the, the point we're making here, y'all, know your data. Yeah. Look at it. Because if you're not even paying attention to which day seems to be best, if you're not even paying attention to how show rates differ from three day versus five day out, like you're, you're missing out because there's going to be windows that matter there. So that's interesting. I'm curious. Like, so now I want to know like across industries, if it's, you know, similar or not. I always thought Mondays, like, and we did have the data show booking on a Monday was just awful. Cause most of the time people come into their week, they're like, ah, shit. Like, I don't want to take this meeting, <laughs> but it could also know. be a function of not a lot of people just missing Monday at work. Mm -hmm. And once it's on a calendar, people, you know, in general, um, tend to, tend to attend. Yeah, for sure. If it confirmed it, which is the other bonus tip there is send the invite on the call and ask them to accept it. Yeah. Hey, Eric, I shoot the invite right now. Could you accept that for me? So I know it didn't go to spam. I love that. And you shut up. Can't I'm sending it right now. Can you accept it for me so that I know it didn't go to spam? And then you hit them with the Tony Robbins promise line. So Tony Robbins sales team tested this and they saw like a 30% lift in show rates by asking people to promise to give their best effort. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I know a lot of things can happen and pop up, but hey, we promise to make your best effort to be there for me. Consistency right there. If y'all haven't read Robert Kieldani's Influence, y'all better go read it. Influence and persuasion. All of this has been studied. This is not just two gurus talking about nonsense. Like <laughs> stuff is real out there. So the law of consistency, I'm going to get you to accept and I'm going to get you to commit, right? Because yeah. now what can I say in the follow-up email? You promise. I really appreciate your commitment to being there on yeah. Friday. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's crazy. People will go to the ends of the earth to stay consistent to themselves mm -hmm. and what they said, because their word is oftentimes gold. Yep. Absolutely. And most people that live by a code think that. Absolutely. These are some real golden nuggets. And I love that we're kind of moving into the weeds and up to kind of like the brain, kind of really the brain science of it all. When you get mm -hmm. right down to it, why why do humans behave in the way that they do? I think that the next place that I would love this conversation to go, because I, I want to keep pumping you for free, great insights, um, <laughs> is the idea of social proof, which I find to be one of the, the least well understood, but most powerful elements usable in any prospecting scenario. Uh -huh. Another sure. Cialdini, you know, like... Law of Six influence. pillars of influence. Oh, oh, law, law of influence, right? So the the one on social proof, funny enough, I'm I'm in a large WhatsApp chat room with a bunch of salespeople, sales leaders. This actually happened today getting brought up. Like someone put some emails in there. They caught me in a down moment. Wow, I'm giving feedback, right? I'm diving into it. So there's some back and forth here. And then one person was like, yeah, so like, we you know, we help companies do X, Y, Z. I said, no, 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 no. You don't help companies. You help people. Companies mm. do not exist. People do. Science does not exist. Take away the people. There is no company. So right. you help people, right? This is where people get social proof all the time wrong, is you're yes. reaching out to a person talking about a company. Guess what? They can't relate to a company. They can only relate to another person. person. So that's the first part is you need to give social proof about people. Second, you need to make sure you tell the full story. People cannot relate with the end result. They can only relate with the beginning. And so what a lot of social proof sounds like is we helped Facebook to X their pipeline, <laughs> right? Obviously a lot wrong with that, but they say to X their pipeline is the end result. I cannot identify with that end result where if it says I actually helped KD, the VP over at winning by design, he was struggling to onboard his reps and it was taking too long for them to ramp. 
after working with us, they were able to bring that ramp time down. Now I can identify with the beginning because that is where I am. And y'all, we know this. Think about any of like the fitness ads or anything. If they only showed the after, you don't believe it. Right. If they know the before and after, I can identify with the before and hope for the after. Whereas yeah. if you just show me the after, I'm like, dude, that dude's ripped. I'm not ripped. I can't identify. Yeah. It's like, oh, that dude over there looks like me. That's where social proof, social proof to the person, but you have to share the beginning struggle and the end result because they'll identify with the beginning and then hope for the same end result. You know what else is really interesting and fascinating to me, you know, and I'm going to double back on something you said earlier, because I think it's priceless and just a, a wonderful in, insight. And that is that good messaging takes time. One of the places that I would argue that you want to go to find good messaging is to look into the social proof story so that you can get to like the KD, the VP at winning by design, his story, and then learn what it was in his before mm -hmm. so that you can start to pick up on the pattern of exactly why the next KD that works for an organization similar to winning by design might care in the same way mm -hmm. so that I have it, that context. It's, it's so important. I will give you all kind of like, you know, as we start to wrap up here, when I join a new company or I'm going after a new industry, what I do is I will interview 20 to 30 customers. And there are six questions that I ask them, right? And this gives me borderline everything I need to build out my scripting, my messaging and everything else, right? So first question, why did you buy? Yeah. Why did you buy? Right. As salespeople, we think we know why people buy. We have no idea. So first question, why did you buy? Second question, what problem were you hoping to solve? What problem? And notice problem, not problems. Right. What problem? I want to know what's the first thing that comes to mind. I say, what problem were you trying to solve? Next question, what were you afraid of before buying? Mm. That's what? a great one. What were you afraid of before buying? This is where I'm going to get the unspoken objections. Yes. Your prospect isn't always going to tell you the real objection, right? When someone says I'm too busy, what they might really be thinking is this looks way too hard to onboard. Yeah. It's like, what were you afraid of before buying? Right. Next question. What's your favorite part of the product? What's your favorite part of the product? Next question, what's changed the most since you've gotten the product, right? What's changed the most? And then the last question here is, how would you describe what we do to another persona? <laughs> like, how would you describe what we do to another VP of sales? Like, if another VP hits you up and said, hey, like, what science do? Right. What would you say? Now, working backwards here, y'all, I'm going to tell you what this sets up. So first of all, we're going to get their language. I always tell the story from, um, from Patient Pop when I joined in a lot of our outbound messaging said all in one practice growth platform. How many doctors do you think have ever said the words all, in, all one. in one practice growth platform? Zero, but that's what we were sending in our emails. So yeah. you got to get their language. How would they describe it to someone else? And what you're going to find there, y'all, by the way, is a lot of comparison language. Yeah. You know what? It's a lot like blank, but blank, which is a good thing. We cannot understand without comparison. Just something to, to remember. It's an immediate context setter. Right. And it's okay, right? Like if it's too novel, it scares people. Yeah. Oh, it's actually a lot like blank, but blank. Oh, okay. That, that makes some sense, right? Yeah. What's changed the most? I'm getting some micro testimonials. What's my favorite part of the product? That's what I know to now call out in my emails and my messaging, right? What was I afraid of? Those are the unspoken objections. What problem were you trying to solve? That's where I'm getting my problem-based language. And why did you buy? I'm getting my ideal end result language. 20, 30 of those, and you have everything you need to build better messaging. Most salespeople never talk to customers. They only right. talk to products. 
Go, I promise y'all, if y'all forget everything that we talked about today, but you go interview 30 customers and get those answers, you will improve your pipeline significantly. I can't give you a number because I don't know where it's at, but I can guarantee you your messaging will get better if you start to go do those things. Boy, truer words have never been spoken. Those six questions are so spot on, so genius. Thank you for sharing those. And I do want to be respectful of time. This has been like just a power packed episode full of immediate takeaways, immediate perspective shifters for a lot of folks. And frankly, I think demonstrate just how good you are <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> at what you do. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time to kind of share that, all that with us and our audience. Appreciate you. For sure. For sure. I'll, I'll leave you with this because it came up in the, the WhatsApp today, right? Because sometimes the gurus get hate, right? The gurus get hate. Paid? Are you kidding me? Just ridiculous, right? The gurus will hate this, right? These thought leaders don't know. And one of them said, KD, you're not a guru. You're a do-ru because you actually do this stuff. Oh, I said, I "I will take that to my grave. KD, the guru will be on my gravestone at the end, y'all. But all everything we're talking about here, y'all, this stuff, it works. This is from the trenches. This has been tested. I've gone through it myself personally. I'm only six months removed from having a hundred person sales team, all of whom are prospecting. So I've tested so much of this and seen it work. So hopefully people got value from this. Absolutely. And for those in the audience who might want to get in touch with you, might want to learn more, might want to find out about the wonderful um, projects or companies that you're involved with. Um, you, can, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I have my own podcast, Live Better, Sell Better as well. Um, and that's where you can learn more about just different, different topics. So I'd say follow me on LinkedIn, listen to the podcast, Live Better, Sell Better. And I do have my Patreon where there's like 30 some hours now of this type of like true training art is in the Patreon as well. Cold calling, objection handling, email, copy, all of that is in there. So if people are interested, they can give that a look. Love it. Once again, thanks so much, Katie. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, man. All right.